Hey guys, how's it going? So right now I'll be talking about the HP Omnibook Ultra. This is brand new for 2024, and also in this video I'll be talking about the new Intel Core Ultra, also known as Lunar Lake. This is their second generation, so this is going to be a two-part video. If you only care about the benchmarks, then just skip ahead, but I will start off with the laptop first. So why did I choose this laptop to showcase the new Intel Core Ultra versus some of the other laptops you might have seen out there? Typically, reviewing units are usually asus products so i figured i should try to be a little bit different um, by showcasing something else and also this is one of the few laptops that actually has the evo certification i don't really know what that means these days but intel does have to certify these laptops to get that branding but i will say though after using this laptop if the s14 is any like the s16 that i recently did a video on this is actually a better product. So let's just get right into it. Let's just first start with the build and the design. And it is really nice. It's a clean black look and it's made out of all aluminum, a really high quality aluminum too, a little bit flex towards the middle, but no one's gonna be doing this on a regular basis. So I'm not even gonna call that a knock. I don't know how I feel about the HP logo though. For some reason, when I see the Dell logo or the HP logo, it doesn't really strike premium to me, probably because I just grew up with their very cheap and budget level laptops back in the day before I was buying premium products. Maybe it's just me in my head. Let me know in the comments what you guys think. But anyway, and then at the back, I like how it's tapered a little bit too with the curve. It makes it easier to pick up when it's on a desk because these feet are incredibly flat, so it sits really flush against the table, which isn't something I can say with a lot of other laptops with their very, very thick and heavy feet. But so this immediately makes it a lot more comfortable to use. And then on top of that, you are getting ventilation at the back, and I know I do complain about that, but in this laptop, um, spoiler for later on ahead, this laptop under load does not get hot to the touch, maybe a little bit warm, and even with the fans on max speed, it's actually really quiet too, but in most situations, you won't even be hearing the fan. And also on the back, there are some speaker grills, and I will say though, the speakers aren't the best sounding speakers I've ever heard, even at a 14 inch level. I would say that they are mid tier. I will say that they get really loud though, so that's actually really good, without too much distortion. So. Anyway, so let's open up the lid and it doesn't always open up easily with one hand. You can see that it lifts off the ground a little bit, but what was fast though was Windows Hello. And even better, say you're not looking at the camera itself, it also supports a fingerprint reader and that works incredibly fast too. I love having both options on a laptop. Windows Hello is really nice and convenient, but you're not always looking directly at the laptop itself. So having this is really convenient. So now that we're here, let's take a look at the lid. You are seeing some feet, or I don't know what exactly to call these, but because this laptop does rotate 360, so it is a two-in-one convertible. And the hinge is really nice too, nice and solid, but then not too difficult to lift up and down. And when you're actually using it as a touchscreen, it doesn't wobble too much. So it's really secure, really good job HP. And I can't believe I don't use much AP HP laptops because this is really impressive to use overall. And Windows on Touch is a lot more fully featured than a lot of people realize. Not only are there a lot of gestures, so swiping to the right brings up your calendar and your notifications, swiping to the left brings up your news and widget feed, which quite frankly, nobody really uses. Any window can just be pulled away from its tab and then just be dragged anywhere bringing it up, does full screen. And you can also select how you want it to snap. It's really convenient. So not a lot of people talk about the touchscreen features. And if you swipe with three fingers up, that brings up your multitasking, three fingers down. Four fingers down takes you to your home screen. So yeah, so having a touch screen on Windows is really nice. It's very tablet-like and this orientation is fairly slim too. I mean, of course it's folded in half, so it's not the slimmest tablet out there, but it's very usable. And at, a, at 14 inches, this is exactly where you want a tablet to be. And then also because of that, you get multiple different angles too. And then whenever you're ready, you're right back into a tablet mode. You don't have to deal with any flappy cases or anything like that. So this is a really cool feature. And especially when you're gaming, being able to turn this around so you could be right next to the screen and then just be able to game, um, to be able to game comfortably. And I'll talk about some gaming benchmarks soon. Yeah, 
I think it's a really underrated feature that a lot of people don't ever talk about. One issue with convertibles, the bezel is a little bit thick at the bottom here, and it's also thick on the top too, which takes away from the premiumness a little bit, but you know, I guess I can't complain too much. But also what I don't like about typically with convertibles is you're left with this very ugly looking hinge here. It's not as flush and integrated as it is with a lot of all the laptops, but it seems like this is the only way to get a convertible type of laptop. So if that's something you value, you just have to deal with the sacrifice to the aesthetics a little bit. But you know, I can imagine people who are practical people wouldn't really mind. And speaking of practicality, let's take a look at some of the ports. And what's interesting, and I've only noticed that HP does this, is having ports on the corner and actually having a piece of the laptop essentially chopped off gives it a very angular look. And it looks very interesting. It kind of messes with my OCD a little bit to have the back of the laptop angled while curved on the front. And it carries through even when you open it too but it ends up being really convenient because you're able to have the cables offset it's not like some of the gaming laptops where all the ports are at the back but then sometimes they're just difficult to reach to and you can't really see what they are this creates a good balance but anyway carrying on on the left you're getting a headphone jack they have some branding here for poly studio this is essentially the the webcam software on the other side you are getting a thunderbolt for and another one in the corner here as well. And speaking of which, I connected the display ports to my Odyssey G9 behind me, which is essentially two 4K monitors sandwiched together and it supported the full resolution at 120 hertz. So does the new Ryzen 9 AI chip, but the Snapdragon X chips don't. So that's something interesting to note right there. So right away, when I realized that the Snapdragon X Elite chips became useless to me, one thing I'm disappointed about is there are no USB type A ports. That's something that I still use to this day, though most new products are starting to ship with USB C, which is nice to have in 2024, but I'm pretty sure everybody has a whole bunch of legacy products that still use USB A. So you'll have to be living in the dongle life. Anyway, I just and I want to talk about the keyboard. And this is one reason why I believe that this is better than the S16 and the S14, because this keyboard is phenomenal to type on. It doesn't feel like a typical membrane style keyboard is really clicky. I believe it may be a chiclet style keyboard, which is usually higher quality. It requires a decent amount of actuation force, but once you press it down, it's really snappy. It's really crispy and it just pops right back up. Not a crazy amount of travel, but I mean, like once a laptop is open, like look how thin this is. They're, they can only get away with so much, but what they did with this keyboard is really good. One of the best thin and light keyboards I've ever used. So really happy about that. And the good news continues with this trackpad. It's actually a haptic trackpad and the vibration motor in it is pretty decent. Not the best out there, not as good as something like the MacBook or when I had the MSI Titan 18. But one good thing about these types of trackpads is you can press it at any of the corners and it registers because it's not actually pressing a button. It's using a vibration motor to simulate being pressed and it does a fairly convincing job. And just really quick coming back to the trackpad, considering this is a 14 inch laptop, it's really large and that's awesome. One interesting thing I noticed about the trackpad is they're not using Windows Precision drivers. They're actually using Synaptics. And honestly, years ago, that probably could have been a bad thing, but it seems like these drivers are a lot better than they were before. It's fairly similar to the Microsoft Precision drivers, so I don't think that's necessarily a con. So next, I'm just going to quickly talk about the display. It's OLED, 120 hertz. It supports variable refresh rate from 48 to 120 hertz color gamut is incredibly high it doesn't get insanely bright but it's more than good enough for most situations except for maybe if you're looking at this directly outdoors and sunlight but yeah good display okay so let's get right into it so one of the first things i want to start doing from going forward is testing the stability there's a lot of times when you just run a benchmark it'll show high, but then as you use a laptop more and more, it'll start to slow down. That especially happens with thin and light laptops. So what this does is it runs the same benchmark 
20 times to see if it starts to dip down and it doesn't. The best score I got was 6,138 and the worst score I got was 6,030. So the good thing is, is the performance you get in a quick and dirty benchmark is the same performance you'll get after hours and hours of use, which is great. And this laptop does really good with temperatures too. And so I'm just gonna go right into gaming because this is a very capable gaming machine. But I think what happened here, because this Omnibook is so thin and light, and the advertised TDP is only 17 watts, but in many situations, it'll push to 35 watts, and then it'll taper down to 28 watts, and that's kind of what it would hover around throughout most of the gaming sessions. So, but anyway, in general, I'm not getting as high frame rates as I was expecting based off of the initial reviews that I looked at. It seemed like the Intel Core Ultra Series 2 should be outperforming the competition, which is the AMD 890M or the AMD 880M. But I'm thinking maybe because this Omnibook 14 is such a thin and light machine, it's not really living up to the full potential of what this new chip can offer. But I should be getting in the new Galaxy Book 5 Pro soon. So I'll definitely be coming back to this chip again as I get more devices in. But anyway, Lunar Lake on this HP Omnibook is not class leading. In fact, the 890M and the 880M is beating it in almost every single game. And one thing I want to point out about the test that I run with gaming is... I don't use frame generation. I do not enjoy playing with frame generation. And, and most of the tests I did, unless stated otherwise, aren't even using DLSS, AMD's FSR, or Intel's XESS. So you can keep that in mind and you can expect better scores if you were to play around with Intel's XESS. I will say though, Intel's AI upscaling looks really good, really crisp. But it's interesting though, when I ran Time Spy, it is beating the competition, so I'm not exactly sure what's going on. Actually, I just remembered why. I'm coming here after the fact, but Time Spy is biased towards Intel more than it is to AMD chips. That's why it's not translating into real gameplay. And this is still early days for these brand new Intel Core Ultra Series 2 chips, aka Lunar Lake, so we'll just have to see how it goes as time progresses. So what I wanted to do next is run Steel Nomad because that is a cross-platform test. So I'm able to compare it to a whole bunch of different types of devices. Well, one reason why I do use this benchmark though is look at the iPad. I don't know what the TDP on the iPad is, but that thing is so thin and it's sealed. There's no fan, so it can't be running at 15 to 30 watts. And it's just destroying everything else out there. I think Apple is just touting Windows. The new M4 chip on that iPad Pro is using a second generation three nanometer process. So that, and on top of Apple, just having a lot more experience with designing these types of chips, which are meant to be as performant as possible while also being efficient as possible. So it looks like when the M4 Max come out, as much as Intel and AMD caught up in the thin and light yet having good performance game, Mac is probably going to shoot ahead really fast too. And that shows up in Geekbench too. So take a look at the single core. The, the iPad M4 really just shoots ahead of the competition and it's even beating some fully fledged gaming laptops out there and in multi-core, and in multi-core is no exception too. But then on the GPU's core, that's when the iPad really goes crazy and the M4 just takes over everything else. And I also want to point out that the Galaxy Book 4 Edge with the Snapdragon X Elite 84100, which is the most powerful variant of the Snapdragon X Elite chip, is performing almost on par with the new Core Ultra 7, at least in this thin and light HP Omnibook. And the reason why this is the only time you're seeing the GPU score for the Snapdragon X Elite chips is because this is running natively on ARM in games it's using emulation, so I didn't think it would be fair if I included those in the gaming benchmarks. So where does that leave us for performance? It's pretty much on par, Intel did catch up, but then when Apple jumped into the race again with their M4, based off of what I'm seeing on the iPad, Apple is just gonna destroy the competition again. So both AMD and Intel can't just start celebrating yet. They gotta get back to work so they can catch up.